We forget, however, 
loves you without condition, today, tomorrow, and always. Praise be to God.
So this mustard seed is literally barely being grasped on my forefinger and thumb. They're itty bitty tiny, and those of us who plant things like radishes and broccoli are well aware of the size of the seed. They're very similar, they're all the same thing. So if I were to plant this mustard seed, what do I do? How do you tend a mustard seed when it's planted? Just let it go. You just let it go. You put it on the ground. You put it on the pavement. Where do you put it, Greg? Well, a little bit of dirt. <laughs> a little bit of dirt. A little bit of water. A little bit of sunshine. A little bit of warmth. And a little bit of love. A little TLC. Who here talks to their plants in their gardens? <laughs> I talk to my plants all the time. I say, this is what I say, please don't die. <laughs> please. Don't make me a murderer. <laughs> so when Jesus talks about that mustard seed, you know, it's this teeny tiny little thing. And we all have that little kernel, that little, the Quakers call it the spark, that tiny little mustard seed of faith that's implanted in all of us. And what do we need to help that grow? What are things, some of the things that help, I don't know, that little bit of God in us grow, that little bit of faith in us grow? How do we grow spiritually? A little bit of love? A little bit of tending, a little bit of water, a little quiet, a little bit of community. Somebody talking at us saying, please, please, <laughs> oh, don't die. <laughs> Let's have a little mustard seed prayer. Holy Creator, how lucky are we to be given this kernel of faith? And how fortunate are we to be in this amazing community that nurtures us, waters us, tends us, and loves us. And together our faith grows into a wonderful garden, offering shade and rest to the weary. Amen. Amen. First reading is from 1st Samuel. Then Samuel went to Ramah, and Saul went up to his house in Gibeah of Saul. Samuel did not see Saul again until the day of his death, but Samuel grieved over Saul. And the Lord was sorry that he had made Saul king over Israel. The Lord said to Samuel, How long will you grieve over Saul? I have rejected him from being king over Israel. Fill your horn with oil and set out. I will send you to Jesse, the Bethlehemite, for I have provided for myself a king among his sons. Samuel said, How can I go? If Saul hears of it, he will kill me. And the Lord said, Take a heifer with you and say, I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. Invite Jesse to the sacrifice, and I will show you what you shall do, and you shall anoint for me the one whom I name to you. Samuel did what the Lord commanded and came to Bethlehem. The elders of the city came to meet him, trembling, and said, Do you come peaceably? He said, Peaceably. I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. Sanctify yourselves and come with me to the sacrifice. And he sanctified Jesse and his sons, and invited them to the sacrifice. When they came, he looked on Eliab and thought, Surely the Lord's anointed is now before the Lord. But the Lord said to Samuel, Do not look on his appearance or on the height of his stature, because I am rejected him. For the Lord does not see as mortals see. They look on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks on the heart. 
Then Jesse called Abinadab. 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 And made him pass before Samuel and said, Neither has the Lord chosen this one. Then Jesse made Shammah pass by, and he said, Neither has the Lord chosen this one. Jesse made seven of his sons pass before Samuel, and Samuel said to Jesse, The Lord has not chosen any of these. Samuel said to Jesse, Are all your sons here? And he said, There remains yet the youngest, but he's keeping the sheep. And Samuel said to Jesse, Send and bring him, for we will not sit down until he comes here. He sent and brought him in. Now he was ruddy and had beautiful eyes and was handsome. The Lord said, Rise and anoint him, for this is the one. Then Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the presence of his brothers. And the Spirit of the Lord came mightily upon David from that day forward. Samuel then set out and went to Ramah. And the Gospel reading is from Mark chapter 4. He also said the kingdom of God is as if someone would scatter seed on the ground and would sleep and rise night and day, and the seed would sprout and grow. He does not know how. The earth produces of itself, first the stalk, then the head, then the full grain in the head. But when the grain is ripe, at once he goes in with his sickle because the harvest has come. He also said, with what can we compare the kingdom of God? Or what parable will we use for it? It is like the mustard seed, which when sown upon the ground is the smallest of all seeds on earth. Yet when it is sown, it grows up and becomes the greatest of all shrubs, and puts forth large branches so that the birds of the air can make nests in its shade. With many such parables he spoke the word to them, as they were able to hear it. He did not speak to them except in parables, but he explained everything in private to the disciples.
The sheep and cattle are saved to be used in a sacrifice to God. Saul's disobedience in this upsets God, and Samuel rebukes Saul. Though Saul is contrite, it makes no difference. The Lord was sorry he made Saul king over Israel. The lesson that we can take is to trust God no matter what, even if that no matter what is incomprehensible and horrific. In our Bible study, Gerard summed it up really succinctly with the one three-letter word, yuck. <laughs> Do we really need this lesson to be told this way? I don't know. John Calvin says that God speaks to us in ways that we can understand as a nurse to a baby. Perhaps this is a way that spoke more to an ancient people than it does to modern Americans. In the UCC, we're the church that believes that God is still speaking. And that denotes change. As, ch as we change and evolve, as human knowledge stretches to new levels, so our worldviews must change as well. And there are all sorts of yuck passages in the Bible. And it's important not to turn away from them completely, or to turn away from our faith because of them. Different world views and a different human understanding come at different times of human development. And there are no neat and easy answers. And while this passage was difficult, it really opened up a lively and passionate discussion on faith and how we understand God's love. It also reminded me of something a former colleague said to me. And it was while I was still shadowing at the street ministry. In particular, I was a little anxious about how to perform an outdoor worship service on the corner. So I would show up as any number of Sundays that I could. So whatever Sunday I had free, I would show up. We had four ministers rotating the outdoor service. And every single service I made it to was the same pastor. Pastor David. No matter what day, whether it was two weeks in a row, day to day. I let a week go by or two to day. Always day. And I never saw anyone else's services. It was so funny, and I took it to be a little bit of a sign. Dave was, um, or is, was the most traditional of the street pastors. He was a, a huge guy. He was tall, heavy set round-faced, cheerful, loving, sincere, and authentic. One morning after service, we all followed Pastor Dave back to his car, which was typical. That would be for a soft and Dunkin' Donut car distribution. And a couple of guys started to get into an argument. They started shouting at each other at the back of the car. Now, there is an etiquette on the street. They were starting to fight, so they moved away from the pastor's car to show him some respect and let people get on with what they were getting on with. And so as they moved away, a little pushing, a little shoving, and an old-fashioned fist fight broke out. And Big Dave, huge Dave, just shot after them, just sprint. I couldn't believe he could move so fast. He's so big. And he brought peace back to them. And as he was running up, this gal turned to me and said, just after Pastor was talking about our pray first, and a pray for, for your information, uh, is what Pastor Dave called the people you have to pray for every day, the people you struggle with, the people you have conflict with. He would call those your pray for. So who's your pray for this week? And you're to pray for them every day. So aside from the wisdom of praying for people with whom we struggle, Pastor Dave noted something that I have found to be true throughout. And he said to me one day, people crave to hear the gospel. 
If you preach the gospel, they will come. And especially now that things are so tough, people crave to hear the gospel. We craved it Wednesday night when we were grappling with Samuel. I think it's true. We crave to hear the gospel because we yearn for those lessons of compassion, of forgiveness, love, and God's grace. And while there can be seen to be great differences between the Hebrew scriptures and the Christian New Testament, the New Testament has its roots, obviously, deeply in the Hebrew scriptures. Jesus, after all, was a Jew, as my Israeli friend reminds me frequently. Major themes, major elements of our faith flow throughout both the Hebrew scriptures and the New Testament. In this morning's reading from 1 Samuel and Mark, we find one such theme. The theme is the unexpected. If you think of God's kingdom to be the biggest, most glamorous thing in the world, led by the strongest, wisest, biggest, think again, David is young. The mustard seed grows into an everyday shrub, not some glamorous, glorious tree. And I started the process of looking at different churches for settled ministry. I was told by someone to read every profile on the UCC list, and I did. And I noticed that many churches describe themselves as small but mighty. It struck me as a kind of affirmation, one might say, in front of the mirror. <laughs> I'm small but mighty. <laughs> I saw it in this into so many church profiles that I really began to think of it as, oh, well, here's another church on the way out. We're trying to put a fresh spin on things. And I don't know why I had become suddenly so cynical. I don't know why that judgment came into me when I read that phrase. I'm going to use the excuse that it was COVID angst creeping in. But it's really hard to say small but mighty. What I can tell you is that whatever I was thinking, I was not thinking biblically. Small but mighty. As I would read on in the profiles, once I got over myself, I'd read about the work these churches were doing in their communities. We're small, but we provide a free community meal every month. We're small, but we host visiting youth groups. We're small, but we volunteer once a month at our local soup kitchen. We knit for newborns. We have a reading card ministry for the lonely and the homebound. If that's, if that's not the kingdom of God on earth, I don't know what it is. Small, mighty acts. Kindness. Mutual respect. Humor. Both of this morning's readings highlight a theme found throughout the Bible, small but mighty, the mustard seed, growing into a large shrub with birds in shelter in its branches. Interesting that it's a shrub, not a cypress, not an oak. The youngest and smallest of Jesse's sons, chosen by God to be king, to the surprise of Samuel and Jesse, and I'm sure David. In both, there's a humility, an everydayness. The kingdom of God is not an alabaster palace on a cloud. It's not a chariot with lightning bolts. It's a common shrub, shielding and protecting birds. In the Samuel reign, God doesn't choose the biggest, strongest of Jesse's sons. He chooses the youngest, the shepherd. He chooses the one the others didn't even bother to invite to the feast. Small but mighty, flying under the radar, doing good, sharing love, following Jesus in everyday ways. New Testament scholar Ken Perkins writes, Jesus may have told the mustard seed parable to counter the impression that God's rule had to appear among the great and powerful. I see God's rule in those small but mighty things, in the everyday sharing of love and care, as this church does. You can see it in the way you all interact, you enjoy each other. You can see it in the work you do, the 
monthly communion offering, a wonderful way to reach out into the community, sharing our love and concern with organizations committed to creating a better world, a better community, from bookmobile to food shelves to the animal rescue, or the mitten tree, which to some might seem small, but hand-knit woolies that took time and care to make. Beyond the real, very real warmth and physical comfort, imagine what a hand-knit scarf might mean to a domestic abuse survivor. It brings more than warmth. It can become its own symbol, a symbol of the unconditional love it took to knit. And that might be felt for the very first time by the receiver. Imagine feeling that for the first time. And now you've embraced the welcome home ministry, the literally first congregational church giving a home to the initiative. And through welcome home, individuals and families who are moving into permanent housing from houselessness will be provided with kits of essentials that will help make their house a home. It's small stuff. We haven't solved homelessness. It's laundry detergent. It's shower curtains. It's pots and pans. It's not glamorous. It's brooms and dust pans and measuring cups. But it's big stuff. It's like the mustard seed. It's like the mustard seed that grows into the shrub. It's the stuff of love of hospitality and welcome. It's the stuff of the kingdom of God, nearly sliding under the radar, easily missed. But oh, is it so important. Amen. Do we have um, any joys or concerns or any prayers this morning? Well, I have a joy because we had breakfast again yesterday with the women of the church and it was wonderful. I tried my hardest to find something sweet, so I didn't, and I just looked longingly at the golden waffle on the side of the mesh just on that side. <laughs> Close to perfect weather we're enjoying right now. Oh, 
Now, hallelujah! Summer in its perfection. Thank you. 